Hi guys, and welcome back to the Shakedown. Last time I told you that this episode was kind of a mess and we had a lot of interruptions and Ben David broke into the house and we, we haven't even gotten to the point in the episode where he explains why he came over to Malone's house. We're getting there. Um, we're going to break it down into small chunks and there there's some good points. This part right here, we're talking about what got us into comics. Um, Malone start started by asking me, uh, why I got into comics, and uh, we go from there. We both tell our stories about why we got into comics and kind of what it was like to to draw comics in prison. Um, I know it's not our normal stuff, but hopefully you guys find it interesting. All right, and here it is, the continuation of this episode of The Shakedown. <laughs> You had a vision for this Green Lantern character, the Kyle Rayner Green Lantern. You thought you were going to do with something with it. And this led you down. Were you already a writer before this? Did you, you know, did you, uh, had you uh, okay. pursued writing as a hobby or a profession before this? Yeah, so that is a good question. So when I came to prison, you know, I was a software developer before I came to prison. And I knew beforehand that I did not, I wasn't going to be able to keep up my skills. I knew that before I was going in, I was trying to think of what I would be able to do. And even though I you were forewarned about uh, uh, the computerless situation of Texas prisons. Well not, well, not necessarily about Texas prisons. I just kind of logically figured it out. I knew I wasn't going to be able to use a computer. I just, I, I mean, like, so one thing is, is like, it's not just even just about using a computer. It was, I was doing, I was actively going to classes, reading literature, and I'd have to constantly be teaching myself new technologies all of the time to keep up, to get better jobs, to improve things at work, or to get new, to get new jobs that I wanted. So if I I wasn't going to be able to do that and I was going to be falling behind the entire time I was in prison, I needed to find something else. I needed to find something else I wanted to do. I wanted something else that I could do as well that would help people out. My my ultimate goal was always to not have anyone do, not any, have anyone make the same mistakes that I did and prevent that in some way. That That's always been the ultimate goal and I've always tried to do that. I knew one thing I could, I could do that might lead to that is write. So I actually, before I came to prison, I started trying to write down my story about the accident, about what led up to it. And I was trying to write that down. And I was just writing. I wasn't looking for any guidance. I wasn't taking any classes. I wasn't looking at any suggestions. I was just writing to write. And in prison, I started taking sociology co courses and started writing essays, you know, just for the, the my college courses, my college correspondence courses. And then... I started looking for other ways to write, to practice my writing. I became a reporter for the prison newspaper, The Echo, which did not help me practice my writing because they... Uh, how often did they uh, publish any of your reports? <laughs> they published zero of my reports. <laughs> <laughs> which I, I honestly take as a badge of honor because I would never want to write anything that they would be willing to publish. You know, one of these days, one of our uh, podcasts is going to have to be about the, the, uh, situation, about, the, about the Echo because I've got a perspective of the Echo that you're not going to get from too many people. I was around. The Echo used to be a legitimate newspaper. It was considered the press, right? And had all the freedoms of the press that are allowed every other newspaper in, in the world. I mean, our excuse me, in the United States of America. All the constitutional rights that, that any other reporter had actually were allowed to, were, were, were granted to the uh, prisoners that were writing for the Echo, right? Pretty darn amazing. But they were never used and the, the prisoners were oftentimes told what they could publish or what they couldn't publish it, up until an actual real reporter for the Texas Monthly got locked up in Texas prison. And where'd they put him? They put him in the, in the walls unit where he immediately got a job working at, at the Echo. And he published a couple of gaming articles. This happened roughly around 2000 because uh, I can remember clearly when it happened because it happened at the exact same time that they had a real high publicity snafu happen on the actual lethal injection table there when they were executing a guy. A guy coughed up a handcuff key as he was dying, right? Because he had some kind of plan. He was planning some kind of escape. He obviously never did get off the ground. And he had a handcuff key and it was so 
embarrassing to Texas. That, I mean, immediately, of course, you have you have reporters that are watching the execution. And so they see this, and so what do they do? They immediately go out and write about it. And it's a lot of egg on their face. So what does Texas do every time that they have a situation where like this where they're getting embarrassed? They do nothing that would actually prevent what happened. They just do a whole bunch of absolute nothing. So they decided they're going to shake down everything in TDC. The entirety of TDC got locked down as if some guy up in Dalhart could possibly affect <laughs> the I, death row inmate hacking up a key. I, 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 lo- I love that are, response. That that's you Remember, that's the classic TDCJ response. That's the, did someone escape? Shake down all of TDC. Did a gun make it into a unit? Shake down all of TDC. Did someone have a heart attack? Shake down all of TDC. But, I mean, it's everything. Exactly. And they went overboard with this one, whereas, you know, in the past, their shake uh, their shakedown generally, there's a lot of inmates that are that are still considered essential workers that are out and about. Well, this one, no. They made sure that every single inmate, every trustee, all the way to every day, everybody that was in administrative segregation was locked up tight while only guards did all of our did all of the duties that normally are done by inmates on the end. We had guards washing our boxes. We had guards making our johnny. We had guards sweeping the run. All of these things were being done by guards. As you can imagine, that didn't go well. <laughs> guards hate that so bad. Well, they, yeah. So I mean, they're not going to wash your clothes. Uh, uh, oh no. They're going to have. They're going to say they did and just throw you some dirty boxes that some other inmate has been wearing. And then they're not. Gonna, are they going to prepare your food? Well, they don't eat it. Why the heck would they do? They're going to write in your peanut butter sandwich, throw it in the bag, crumpled up. It was horrible. It was a horrible situation all the way around, right? And then they told the the initial orders given to the guards for the shakedown is that everything, every rubber band, every paper clip, every, everything gets a major case. Everything. So where do they start with the shakedown? The trustee camp. So <laughs> trustee camp got blasted with over a thousand major cases in one build in one day. There's over, uh, you have a roughly maybe 200 men somehow caught a thousand major cases <laughs> in a single day. So, <laughs> as you, so think about that situation. That became overwhelming real quick. And so they backed off of that. Sadly, the guys that were the trustee camp, what? Hold up. they got the full force of that. Let, let, let's. I, w- I want to break something down because it makes total sense to us, but it's not going to make sense to, to people listening. The trustees, yeah, the, trustee for? the trustees do all the stuff, all the work outside of the unit. Trustees can actually leave the prison. So, like the guys who are cleaning the toilets inside the prison, those aren't trustees. The guys who are who are you, you know handing out toilet paper and stuff like that inside of prisons, those generally aren't trustees. So sometimes, sometimes they are. In general, the the guys who are inside the prison walls are not going to be trustees. Trustees can have a huge range of jobs. Trustees can drive trucks and deliver the food to other units. They'll do maintenance on other other buildings. I worked at a furniture factory and we built courtrooms. We they would and they would sleep overnight places so they could finish, you know, they'd take all every we like we'd build up basically the courtroom on the unit and then put everything on a truck. The truck drivers would ship it over and the trustees would take it over and actually assemble it over at the city hall. So, or at the city building or the county building or whatever. So if the trustees get major cases, they can't be trustees anymore. They're gonna send them back to the building. If you lose all of the trustees, if all of the trustees get major cases, then they can't do that work and you have no one doing that work. So not only does that mean that the inmates can't do that work, but then the unit that makes the peas or the the carrots or the corn, that can't be canned and shipped to the other units around the state. The units that like have the truck drivers, they can't drive. If there's supposed to be a courtroom built on such and such a date, there's no inmates to build it because they decided to shake down everybody and give everyone major cases. And it's like a rubber band is not a major case. And you honestly, you need a rubber band to like hold up your lamplight or whatever, or, you know, two by three by one box or whatever to hold all your commissary on there. And, and but they don't sell rubber bands on commissary. So therefore it's considered a contraband item. Right. If I take like a plastic bag that is that, that like holds my coffee on, on commissary and I put my pencils in it, 
that's technically contraband because now I have, I'm using it for its unintended purpose. Like what you're talking about, that would be a major case. And, and, and we haven't talked about this yet either. Our podcast is called The Shakedown. Like that's what we're naming this after is these shakedowns where they go through and inmates have to take all of their, pack up all their stuff, put it in front of officers. Officers go through every single one of their items and say, this is contraband, this is not, and then write them up for stuff that is considered contraband. Right. Which, interestingly enough, in the context of what we're talking about, oftentimes your art supplies that you have in prison are contraband or considered contraband. That razor we were talking about to to make the pencils, that's contraband. To, to sharpen a pencil properly to do some artwork, your razor blade will be considered contraband. To get a mechanical pencil, which is an enormous advantage if you're going to be doing something like drawing comic books. Infinitely I mean, uh, better. <laughs> that is considered contraband. Any kind of qual- any kind of you know truly uh, uh, professional quality materials, paper or paper or colors or otherwise. Are all would all be considered contraband? You can get them in the craft shop, but you can't take them out of the craft shop. And mo- so a lot of units don't even have craft shops. The cell block and the craft craft shops are dying thing as well. They, they, those things are, are going out. People, uh, I, you have no idea how many how many full sets of pins and and pencils and and markers and so forth else I have gone through in the course of my stay in prison that have just been. Just, I, I, I'm doing nothing with these things but doing artwork. I'm not hurting anybody. That you can't possibly cause anyone any more harm than any of the other, the pins and pencils that they sell or the, the razors that they gave you and forced upon you every single week in prison. They hand you a brand new razor blade, but for some reason, a mechanical pencil, <laughs> you can't have. For, no, for nothing more than the purpose of, their whole entire reasoning is, they don't sell it on commissary. That makes it contraband. Uh, which yeah. is ridiculous because there's a lot of stuff they said don't sell on commissary that's not contraband. All the books that we got, they didn't sell on commissary. Those are things we got into the mail. And it used to be that you could actually, they could send in paper, but now that's contraband. You can't. Oh, yeah. You, you can't get paper or notebooks notebooks that drove me nuts i'm like i would have begged someone to bring in a send in a sketchbook or something like that they can't can't do that that's contraband that uh, it's and it's i mean it's really so you'll buy everything from from commissary so no one other than tdcj gets your money which is insane Get your family's money, not your money. You right. don't make any money. Yeah, that's true. I made zero money in that time. None of us made any money. Said, while you were doing your comic books in prison, you were also having to work a full-time job as, as whatever else you were doing in there. So you're writing your Green Lantern story, and uh, you were working yeah, in the, the furniture factory or wherever. Yeah, the, ma- the majority of the time I wrote that story, I was working – from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. at the maintenance shop Monday through Friday as a clerk. I, I couldn't do much in there uh, as far as writing. Sometimes I'd be able to use that job to actually type up my my Green Lantern stories. That's why I had cool typed up versions of my story. I could I could I had lying around that you could look at. But in general, I what I would do is I'd work six to six. And then when I get back and I had cell time, I'd do some writing back in the cell and then go to bed. And that was it. You know, basically avoid the day room. And then like on the weekends, I'd do some more writing. And that was my free time is just going through and writing those plots out. It was a lot of fun. It was fun coming up with those. And it was it was it was great. The Shakedown is recorded in luxurious Longmont Public Media Studios, and our theme song, Shakedown, is provided by Envato Elements.